tie knit with Jen. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. So it's Monday, Tech Tip Talks. Um, I'm Sarah Walworth. I am a tech editor, a knitting tech editor. I'm Christina McGrath. I'm a knitting tech editor, too. And we come on once a month on the third Monday of every month to answer your questions about um, knitting patterns, um, pattern writing, tech editing, garment, sweater design, knitting design in general. Knitting problems. <laughs> We're here. Hi, everyone. Hi, Vanessa. Amy. Crazy Hi, Anita. DK. Anita's here. Um, if you guys have questions for us specifically, maybe about a project that you're working on now or a design or a pattern that you're writing, um, please throw it into the comments. We'd love to chat with you today. Um, we did want to make an important announcement that we have decided to move this live broadcast to YouTube. <laughs> what was that? Moving. <laughs> Yes. Thanks, no, Anita. <laughs> Hi from Denmark. Anita says, looking forward to seeing you on YouTube. Yes. So Instagram is limited in what we can share, um, how it's a little bit difficult sometimes to do the technology um, and make sure that we get it up on our website. So we wanted to move to YouTube because it allows us a lot more flexibility and we actually have plans to invite guests and broaden our talk a little bit to just beyond Christina and me. Um, so starting next month, next our month. tech tip talk will be on YouTube. So we are really excited about it. Cause like Sarah said, Instagram is very limiting. There'll be, it'll just be so much better. We're so excited. So you've got to get over there and subscribe to us on YouTube so that you don't miss us. Right. So, uh, we're pretty easy to find. It's the same, same name, Tech Tip Talk. Mm -hmm. and, and we'll have a, when the newsletter goes out, it will have a link mm -hmm. for that live video and, and that'll be on there. And obviously the, the YouTube link will be on there. So do go to the link in our bio and subscribe to our newsletter and also subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you don't miss us. Um, Cause we'd, we'd hate for you guys to miss our broadcast. Um, and feel free to send us questions as you run into something and any question is good for us. Like no mm -hmm. question is too small. Feel free to send us a question as you're working through your projects um, or anything during the month and we'll address it in our tech tip talk. So next month, uh, our broadcast will be on June 21st at noon Eastern time and it will be on YouTube. So that's pretty exciting. <laughs> um, and we do have some, an announcement related to our book. We she, have sent the book to our editor. So we're really excited about that. We're meeting with her tomorrow to talk about our next steps and what happens next and what we're doing next. And we're really excited to be in this next stage of moving this project forward. We're so excited about it. And she really thought, um, really good things about the manuscript. So that felt really good to hear. Um, so that's the first feedback we've gotten about it besides ourselves. So it's really exciting that she was ex as excited about it as we are. So we're meeting with her tomorrow. We'll figure out more about what's going on and we will keep you guys posted. And she's a tech editor and a copy editor. So we're pretty right. excited to have her insight into our, our ramblings in writings. Yep. <laughs> um, so we've moved on from just writing to now we'll be doing the revising and editing and we haven't decided exactly how we're publishing yet. So um, we'll, we'll let you know when we know more about that. So please do make sure you're subscribed to our newsletter in because we keep all of our, our audience updated via that. So um, welcome. Hi, Dory. Hi, Nora. Please, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to throw them into the comments below and we can answer them. Um, no question is too small or insignificant. We, we like any kind of question you want to throw at us about 
technical editing, uh, knitting design, or problems related to sweaters or other things. All right, so let's get into a question that we've had in the past that we would like to cover again because we haven't talked about it in a while. And that question is style. Uh, how do you, how do I make my pattern conform to a style? What is style and why is it important? Do you want to, you want to start Christina? As tech editors, we check patterns for style, which mostly relates to the way you're communicating in the pattern and how things are formatted and structured what type of language you use to say certain things, what type of punctuation you use to say things. Um, so all those kinds of things that have to do with the sort of bones of how everything's presented that is not the math, right? Um, and there's so many different ways to be individual here. And there's so many different ways to do things. So that's, that's what the style part is. And that's where so many things have to be consistent in the style to not confuse the knitter. And that's why we check those things. And when we say style, we mean like, what do you use for the abbreviation for knit? Do you use a capital K, a lowercase K? Do you use periods in between the parts of your, um, your line instructions or do you use commas? Do you, do you use a capital K if it's the beginning of a line, but not in the middle of a line? Do you use the word knit instead of a K if it's part of a sentence? Like there's lots of different options and they all have to be consistent to the pattern and done the same way in each instance. And the reason why style is so important is when your style is consistent, it lends a whole uh, layer of professional, um, a professional, I don't know how professionalism to your pattern. If you're using uh, different abbreviations or a different formatting, like one, one repeat, you say uh, repeat to the end. And, but in the next repeat, you say, you don't use that. You say rep to the end or rep around or rep. You just say rep then the knitter may get confused because you're not being consistent. The thing about style is that if it's consistent and clear and everything is done, it's invisible. Consist you don't even notice. You don't. You don't think anything about it. Nobody's going to think anything about any of it. But if something is off and it's not consistent or it's not done the same way, it's going to completely throw a wrench in your whole pattern and confuse your knitter and look like you said, not professional. And it's going to confuse yeah. your knitter and throw them off. And the problem with that is that then makes them not trust your pattern. Exactly. And that's why style is so important because your patterns need to be correct for your knitter, but they also need to be, you know, not confusing and getting things off in style is the easiest way to confuse somebody in a pattern. So as tech editors, this is like one of the things that we do as a separate pass. Like when we edit a pattern, we first look at, we may not look at the technical numbers part of it at all to begin with. We may read through the pattern and then mark the areas where it's inconsistent, where they use different words, different punctuation, and we may ask the designer to send us their style sheet so that we can make sure that their whole pattern conforms to their decisions that they've made, their preferences of how they want it to be formatted and punctuated and how it, they, how they want the pattern to look even. You, your style sheet can even talk about layout if that's important to you or fonts. That's what Anita just asked, is layout the pattern and Norris said the same thing that it applies to the layout too. And it is part of it because if your layout is confusing, um, that's gonna throw off the knitter. But it's, it might not be something, well actually the style sheets that I've built, I have th notes in there about layout, about fonts, about sections about where they're placed in the pattern you know those are all choices that you're making as a designer of how you want your pattern to be and like sarah was just starting to talk about style sheets that's simply a list it's a list of your preferences mm -hmm. 
and how you want things to be. And really, barring making something difficult to understand, you can do whatever you like, as long as you're conveying the information in a clear way. You can have, you can, you can choose, there's so many choices, so many ways you can say things as long as they're clear. Um, and that's why, and, this, and the thing about having a style sheet, the reason it's so great isn't just to give to someone else or so, you know, because you have to have one. There are lots of things in a pattern, lots of elements, lots of places where choices need to be made and lots of places where things are going to happen again and be said again. And if you have it all written down in a list, it makes it easy to write a pattern. It makes it easy to write the pattern and you don't have to remember, you don't have to think, oh, did I check that? Because it's all written right there for you. So you won't miss anything and you won't have to remember anything. So there's a question, Christina. Knit with Jenna asks, can, do you consider style issues errors in a pattern? And when editing, I never know if I should be marking those issues as errors or just suggestions for the designer to consider. Okay, well, if, say that there's three times that just to use the knit and K example, say there's three times that they capitalize the K and then one time that they don't. So I would highlight the one time and say that it needs to be capitalized. If there are style inconsistencies, I mean, they are errors. If there are style inconsistencies and you're not sure which way they really want it to go or you don't have a style sheet to go off of, I would highlight the inconsistencies and say, this needs to be said the same way in every instance. You can say it either way you want, but it has to be the same, so choose just one. I say that a lot. Choose just one. <laughs> Choose one. Choose just one. Make it consistent um, throughout is the way I put it. Yeah, because they are errors. And so mm -hmm. I will say, you know, I've highlighted here, made a note, changed throughout, and then highlight the instances. But you don't have to write it over again every time. But they are errors because mm -hmm. they're not errors in math, but they're mm -hmm. errors in the pattern that need to be corrected for the pattern to be clear and, and, and consistent. And as a tech editor, sometimes I do a completely separate copy of the pattern and just address style on just one side and then I'll name my the returning copy to the designer as style edit so that it's very clear to them hey we're just dealing with inconsistencies in style and things where you need to make a decision on how you want it to look um, and make things consistent throughout and it's kind of separate from technical issues like it's not a make or break in that sense of, uh, you know, to, you have the wrong number of stitches for cast down, you know, that exactly. kind of thing. It's not right. that kind of error. It's not that level, but it's also not just a suggestion. I mean, they really do need to decide how do you want to abbreviate. But that's where it's different. It's not a correct. Right. It's not an error in the way that we're going to say, this is wrong. You have to do it this way. Right. But they have to make a decision about it. And mm -hmm. it has to be done the same way in all the other places. And, and sending a separate style edit is something that I don't do a lot of, but it is very useful to do if you're dealing with a pattern that has tons of style errors or tons of technical errors and your sheet's getting crowded. You know? Yeah. It's a great thing to do to separate those two, like Sarah said, and send a separate document if you've got a lot going on. And so it's... that things don't get missed. Exactly. And it is something that you can, if you're a tech editor, you can talk about with the designer. Hey, you, you might really benefit from a style sheet. Do you want me to start building a style sheet for you um, where you can start to make the decisions? And all it is is a simple document. It can be one page where you decide your punctuation and you decide how you want to uh, indicate right side and wrong side. Do you want to abbreviate or not? Do you want to use a lot of... Before the colon or after the colon. Exactly. Do you want to use a lot of abbreviations or as few as possible? Um, all of these decisions, actually, sometimes when we're writing a pattern for the first time, maybe we're a newer designer, we may not have realized, hey, I do need to think about this. So um, this is a great opportunity for a designer to work with their tech editor that maybe the first couple of times that they work together and decide, hey, what do I want to do with this? Um, in order to make every following pattern consistent to the previous one. Now style becomes something that makes your brand. So this is actually a form of branding. Mm -hmm. and. It makes your brand strong if 
every time a knitter buys your pattern, they are already familiar with how you phrase things. They're already familiar with your with how you abbreviate, how you write. It makes And back them, to that layout question, they're also yep. familiar with how you organize your pattern. How you so organize. Like some designers, if you you know work from their patterns over and over again, you know exactly where to go in mm -hmm. the pattern to find information you need about anything charts. you might need. <laughs> yeah. We might know the charts are always at the end. You might know where you're gonna find their contact info. You'll know exactly where they put the gauge or you'll know whether or not they talk about fit or whether or not they they you know do it in a way you like will there be written instructions with the charts will there how will they be done in a way that you know you'll know and you'll be able to it'll be easier for you to use their pattern so then this adds another layer of trust between you your knitters and you the designer um, when your style is consistent and it's consistent between all your patterns as a branding aspect then man, it, it just adds a whole layer of professionalism and a whole nother layer where the, the knitter can trust you because they're familiar with how you write and they know what to expect. And so. when the style is good, mm -hmm. it makes the whole pattern easier to read, easier to understand, easier to work from. Right. When the style is off and there's mistakes in the style, right. it's like, it it just adds confusion to your pattern. It's a really good thing to to be sure that someone is checking for when they're working on your pattern, a tech editor um, mm -hmm. is the style. It's not something that I think is just, oh, it doesn't matter because it's not the numbers. It matters. I think it, it does matters matter. a lot. It matters a lot because it's kind of like that background. Like if your mm -hmm. background, if you, you know, your background's a mess, <laughs> then it, it, it kind of lends something to the pattern maybe you don't want there. Mm -hmm. So then you, you might ask, well, then how do I make a style sheet or where do I go? How do I start? Um, a lot of times I've told my clients, if there is a, a pattern um, or another designer's work that you really admire, take apart how they explain things or how they write things or how they abbreviate or how they format things. It's not that you copy them, but you can use what they've done for inspiration and to start to build your own style and to start to build, oh, I really like how they did this or I like how this designer did that. Um, it's, there's nothing wrong with that at all. You can also go to, I think, Nitty, K-N-I-T-T-Y dot com has a style sheet on their website for pattern submissions. Um, other publications also put out a style sheet that they want patterns submitted to their publication to conform to. Um, so you can get some ideas there on how a style sheet is built. Is and, there a place online, Sarah, to find, I know in the books I have it, but is there a place yes. online to find pattern templates? Uh, I'm not sure. Now that's a great thing that we can ask our audience. Where do you find a pattern template? Um, I don't know. I'm sure there is. Um, I know Edie Ekman has a style sheet course on Craftsy. Um, and I think there's some other, do you guys have any, um, do you guys know of anywhere where people can purchase or download a pattern knitting pattern template. I'm sure there might be some on Etsy or something like that. I think the only reason I'm asking is because there is a pattern template in the back of um, Kate Atherley's um, right. Beginner's Guide to Writing Knitting Patterns. That's the same. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yep. And um, it can be helpful because, oh, so she, she, Lisa said she thinks that Kate Atherley has one on her site. That's possible. And I think the reason it's helpful to, like Sarah said, look at patterns look or at look patterns. at a pattern template. Mm -hmm. so that you don't miss anything in your decision making. Right. Yeah. You know, there's lots of things to to make style decisions about. And if you're just doing it from from something you just wrote or in your own head, you might miss stuff. And if you're looking at a pattern or at a pattern template, you'll see all the things that need to be decided. Um so if you don't have because maybe, you know, maybe there aren't patterns that you like the way they do it. But go to Maybe all those you know pattern what you elements. you don't want. Yes. Right. So go to all those pattern elements and think about it. Uh, Knititude has one you can purchase on her website. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah. So those are great. two good places. So um, like, and yeah. I did want to mention uh, Lisa from Arctic Woolies. I saw your question about copyright. We're going to get there in a second. Um, I wanted to yes, mention one, more, one more thing about style. Um, 
how you, what fonts you use, what size font you use, your spacing, the white space in your layout, and all those things are related to style. Um, as you're exploring style and deciding what you like and don't like, you might also consider looking into making your pattern accessible for the visually impaired and blind. Um, there are some resources online, including a course that you can purchase uh, through Renee Van Hoy, um, who is on Instagram as R-V-A-N-H-O-Y one. And she also talks on her feed about how to make your pattern accessible and just little tips that you can do uh, to make your style work for people who are visually impaired. So we want to talk about this more in the future as far as accessibility. Um, but we thought we'd throw that out there while we're discussing style, that this is something to consider if you are a newer designer, um, that there is information and guidelines and best practices for making patterns accessible. And that is something that we'll, we'll get into more in the future really yeah. like to talk more about that because I think it's something that people who don't struggle with that mm -hmm. don't think about. Yeah, definitely. When they're it, writing. So it's something we want to devote a whole episode to in the future. Um, and we'll mm -hmm. let you guys know when we're getting ready to talk about that. So do you want to talk about this uh, copy, right? Issue? Let me read well, the... first of all, knitting patterns are like recipes, so they can't mm -hmm. be, um, well, let's like, read your question real quick. Yeah, let's read the as, question. As an editor, do you ever have to worry about if the designer has violated copyrights? So I don't worry about it insofar as the, the whole pattern, right? Like the whole pattern with their, in their words, put together the way they put it together is their own thing. If they're like copying verbatim instructions from somebody else or um, a tutorial and they don't give credit to where the tutorial comes from, you know, things like that need to be not, well, not even need to be, it's, you should say just should, I shouldn't say should, but you know, it's, it's common courtesy to give credit where credit is due. If you've borrowed somebody's work to give as a tutorial or something like that, but mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yes. The pattern itself is theirs, you know? So here's the thing about copyright. Um, it's good as an editor to kind of educate yourself on where that line for copyright is in the knitting industry. Basically, techniques, stitch patterns cannot be copyrighted. Uh, those are things that are, in a sense, part of the public domain. Mm -hmm how that stitch pattern is described and illustrated in a book is copyrighted material. Right. So a lot of stitch pattern books will tell you, you can use the, like, I think Nancy Marchant, I think she allows, I think there's like a clause in there. I could be wrong, but I know in some of the stitch pattern books, it says you can use this for designing your own pattern. Um, so, Stitch patterns and techniques cannot be copyrighted, but the expression of it in uh, print form, digital form, the photographs or the charts or the words, how they're arranged right. on the page is copyrighted. So you can't like copy paste out and right. put it into your pattern and say it's yours. Um, so it's generally good practice to ask permission like, Christina said. But as an editor, what I usually do is I've educated myself what is an issue related to copyright so that if I see an issue that might be a problem, like they use the exact same wording, the exact same. There's only so many ways to describe garter stitch, right? You're not going <laughs> to infringe on right. somebody if you describe garter stitch as knit on every row or round. Right. Um, but if someone has, you know, 
copied an image or something like that, then I would definitely let the designer know, hey, are you aware that this might be infringing on this person's copyright? And I have to say it hasn't really happened to me. I don't think, I think I've only had one instance where a designer came to me and said, hey, I'm afraid I might be infringing on copyright. Do you think I should ask permission? Or do you think? Right. We've had that question. And that's yes. pretty much it. The people tend to, that I've worked with, Again, I haven't run into that a lot, but we have been asked before, is it infringing on copyright if I do this? And we um, advise people to give credit and ask permission for things mm -hmm. that they have not created themselves uh, outside of, you know, techniques and stitch patterns, which like you said, are not copyrighted, but how you express them and how you write them and the way you put them out there is copyrighted. Um, and I think Wooly Wormhead recently had a long discussion about uh, the concept of a design being copied and how does a designer deal with that? Um, because there's only so many ways to make a hat or there's only so many ways to make a top-down raglan sweater and there might be designs that... Uh, kind of infringe on somebody else's bore. Um, so I would look up Wooly Wormhead's recent, I think she had a blog post on this. Um, that I didn't might, see it. Yeah, that might also give you some insight into a, a viewpoint on how do we deal with copying, not necessarily even copyright. Yeah, that's, um, come, that's a tricky thing. It's come up for me with a couple of my clients that that's happened where... Mm -hmm. It was just like, so obviously the same mm -hmm. thing. Um, and that's tricky because there's really not always something you can do about it, you mm -hmm. know, legally or whatever. But that's really cool that she talked about that. I'll have to look that up myself. Yeah, it's, it's a really good discussion um, because, uh, yeah, she makes hats. So there's only so many ways to make a ribbed hat, right? Um, so let's go ahead. Uh, I think, uh, I hope that answered your question, Lisa. If you could let us know if it brings up another question about copyright, um, I'd love to hear that. Um, I think the bottom line is as far as worrying about it as an editor, yes, if you see something that you think that, question. yeah, that raises a question or that, that they're using that you think that, that and they need to give credit for it, say something. Yeah. Ask about it and say query. something. And you can ask kindly. And, um, and see what's going on with that. But if you see something, definitely say something. The biggest uh, thing is, we, is we're not copyright lawyers, so we can't say what thing would be infringing on copyright or not. Right. <laughs> so, and neither might you be a copyright lawyer. So it's good to get educated, but then also refer your designer to the places where you've got good information so that they can seek out um, information that helps them to make some decisions that are um, intelligent in following the laws in wherever you live. <laughs> so she says, thank you. I think it helped. So that's great. I'm yeah. glad. Uh, and we so, have a question. Yeah. Amy says, have you seen Japanese knitting schematics? Oh, yes, I have. What do you think about the amount of details given on the schematics? I'm a fan, <laughs> but this is how I knit and how I work. Um, so I don't know if you all are familiar with Japanese knitting schematics. Are you, Christina? Not really. Not, not really. really. I know a lot about, like, I've, I've not ever worked with uh, that kind of a pattern. I've mm -hmm. worked with the stitch patterning, but I've not worked with an uh, entire pattern like that. So... Correct me if I'm wrong, Amy, but my understanding in the Japanese knitting books that I have is you have the outline of the, the piece that you're knitting, but there will be a lot of information, like your cast-on numbers, how many rows you're knitting, um, shaping information. It's all on the schematic, so you can actually sit there and follow the schematic and not a written pattern. Um, and that's how I knit. So I transfer all of the written information to the schematic and knit that way. That's how I do it. So um, I think it's a great way uh, to give more information. 
Um, and I don't know. I'm a fan. I love it. Am I getting that right, Amy? You'll have to let me know if <laughs> if you're still here. Well, that's, um, you know, that's one more thing um, that kind of makes me think of one more thing to say about, about personal style. Mm -hmm. Like that schematic, like you said in the Japanese knitting patterns, how it gives you more information than just the measurements. Mm -hmm. um, she says, yes, she loves them. I have to see if I can but go it tells find my you book. more details about the pattern. And so you're saying you can just knit the pattern straight from the schematic. So yes, when you're thinking about your style and how you like to explain instructions and how you like to say things, how you like to draw up your schematics, it depends on your audience sometimes. Yes. Like for Sarah, that works really well. She could take that schematic from that pattern and make the pattern without the written instructions and without looking at too much else because she's a really experienced knitter. Mm -hmm. And some people, even if they are experienced knitters, they just don't work that way and they'd much rather have the written instructions. So right. beginner knitters and lots of patterns nowadays are written for beginner knitters. So anybody can pick it up and knit it if they follow the instructions. And that's a very popular style to write that way. Um, right. Back in the old days, you know, knitting patterns were like a little paragraph that you might not have even gotten told, gotten told. You might not, <laughs> you might, you might really just Let's know. Speak English, yes. I know. You might really just know the gauge and mm -hmm. the instructions. You might not be given much more information than that. And it, it might be done in a way that doesn't explain every row or every round. Right. Yeah. It leaves a lot up to the knitter to figure out exactly. the pieces together on them on their own. So right. patterns aren't really written that way anymore, but it is a valid style, right? So Absolutely. I think there's a way to bridge the gap. Like there's a way to, there's a way to be simplified and give mm -hmm. instructions that are simplified and not really verbose. Um, without it being just a little paragraph with nothing but the gauge listed. And so that schematic style, that's like a style of writing schematics and writing patterns. And that is going to appeal to a lot of people. And that becomes your personal style that people can expect. Like you're expecting this from Japanese knitting schematics. That's an example of style. And you, you will change your style or decide, make style decisions based on your audience. And who you know is knitting your exactly. pattern. Exactly. And what they want from you. Exactly. What kind of patterns do they want? I have a client that has a very different style that's kind of old fashioned um, in, in the fact that it's so simple. But what's happened over the years is that that's what people expect from her patterns. Mm -hmm. So we had a pattern recently that we tried to kind of, we we're like, wow, I feel like there's a, there's a different way you could say this that would make it a shorter pattern like it would make it more complicated to say not as simple but it would be shorter right and after going through all of that and thinking about how to say it differently and how we could do it differently it turned out this isn't me this isn't the kind of pattern yeah, i write this is not what your people voice want. Yeah. and this doesn't make it simpler it right. makes it more confusing it's just shorter did we really gain anything by trying to change it you know not really so right. you have to think about your audience too. And if you are trying to write for everybody, there's a way in the same way that you offer written instructions when you offer a chart and you offer a chart when you offer written instructions, there's a way to please all kinds of knitters um, and also be true to your style. Don't you think so? I absolutely agree with everything you're saying. You have to know your knitters. Who are you writing for? So if you love to write, uh, for beginner knitters, then that's who that's your that will will be what your style exudes. That's what your voice is. If you're someone who loves complex patterns for an advanced knitter, then that's the kind of style that you're going to you're going to write for. And in a lot of ways, we might say, well, this is writing to a particular level of knitter, but I, I don't know if I agree with a level mm -hmm. um, necessarily. It could just be that that's your audience. That's who you want to appeal to is someone who has maybe an intermediate knitter who's ready to take on sweater to, um, knitting after doing a lot of accessories. Um, this is well, and of... it's not even just like you said, level of experience. Mm -hmm. No, it's like a preference for how you 
from interact talk with, about with interact with images and interact with words and how do things work for you when you're you know reading and doing something right. everybody's got their own preference so i don't think it means that you're excluding um no yeah all beginners necessarily if you don't have a ton of teaching in your patterns right. you know but if you do have a ton of teaching in your patterns and that's your thing people are going to be looking for that when they get a pattern from you right so um, if you guys have any questions for us, uh, feel free to throw it into the comments. We love that you're here and talking to us. I did want to show you. I don't know if you're going to be able to see, but that's what a schematic looks like in oh, that's my Japanese right book. Um, with a lot of information, like there's charts here, and this is how many you cast on, and this is the shaping, this is where the chart is, and that was for a dolman sleeve. Now, this book is a is a combination of hybrid knitting machine and hand knitting uh, pattern drafting book from uh, a Japanese source. People may not realize that the Japanese were the innovators for the home knitting machine. And so then a lot of their charts and their schematic are based on what my understanding is based on what machine knitters use to um, map out on the schematic itself almost it works like a road map for what you're going to be doing through uh, knitting your whole piece uh, Lisa this book I found it was a it's called knitting pattern drafting by charts for machine knitting and hand knitting and it is a book that is written by George H Smith and Hanyaya I can't say it, Han Ayo Akamoto, and it was published in 1968 by Okamoto Publishing Company in Tokyo, Japan. So um, this was something I found at my used bookstore, and it was a precious find that I've actually used for doing some projects. Um, I really like it. So, um, but, so coming back to style, if you have, see something in a particular book or a pattern book or a pattern that you really like and you want to emulate it, there's nothing wrong with that. That's not infringing on copyright right. to make your design fit a particular style or your pattern writing to fit a particular style. Style cannot be copyrighted in that sense. It's just a matter of making decisions about how you present the information, how you talk about it, what words you use, and things like that. So yes, I do love a good schematic and a useful schematic that works like a roadmap. Um, so well, and like you said, if you don't have that already, you end up making it for yourself anyhow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's just I do. the way you like to do things. Yeah, that's how I'm a very visual knitter. So um, yeah, I think in our industry, there's a lot of room for innovation, even though there's only so many ways to knit things. There's, you know, it's, but there's always ways to innovate. So feel free to innovate in your patterns um, and touch base with your tech editor. Do you think this works or does this not work or how could I improve this? Your working relationship with your tech editor about style is very very useful because they will have seen a lot of patterns and they will know what works and what doesn't work and they might have some suggestions for you to fit the framework of what you want to do um, and to make it so that it's a worthwhile endeavor. So. Right. Well, we had an issue with that this past week. There was a pattern that said to like the way they phrased the repeat was mm -hmm. kind of confusing. But if we changed what came after the repeat and that instruction, mm -hmm. it, 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 it made it make sense. It clarified it. Right. It clarified it. Thank you. And that wasn't being done. But if you can clarify the confusing bit, you can leave the language. You know, there's usually some kind of way, if you really like the style, this particular thing styled this way, um, how can we make it work so that it's not confusing? Mm -hmm. And definitely ask about that if there's something you're wondering about. And those are good questions to ask your, your um, excuse me, testers. Yes. If anything in your pattern you they feel confused by or that, you know, mm -hmm. were there any instructions that tripped you up or that you thought were confusing? Was there anything right. that glared out at you that was confusing to you? Definitely ask your testers. You know, is there, so, is there a part of this that I could have made more clear? Or is there a part that made you scratch your head? Mm. So do you guys have any more questions for us? Uh, I think we've covered 
just about everything we wanted to cover today. Um, I love how it's kind of like style, like the whole thing. It's is great. Style. Well, I don't think we've had a whole episode on style, so I think this is well, good. This is a good conversation. Sarah, I think that's one of the ones that we did do way but back was, before we were recording, before yes. we could record them. We had it. We had a series of tech tip talks when we first started at the beginning of the pandemic and yep. we didn't we didn't we didn't ha- we didn't know yeah. how to record we were a little we didn't tech- know how to how we to were re- newbies at record IGTV. them and save them like it took us a while mm-hmm. to figure that out so there are there were a bunch we did mm-hmm. before we recorded any and that's why when we figured out how to record them we did those um those uh those four yeah whatever however of, many it was yeah we did a bunch that were like subjects and recaps yeah. of things that we knew we had talked about that's why that's why because we couldn't figure out how to record them at first yeah so style question. style is definitely one of those oh yeah we did, What's we the did question? talk about that back then do you have any resources where i can learn grading and how did you guys learn so the first thing i want to say about learning grading and with a caveat is that i took a course from jill wolcott W-O-L-C-O-T-T. She has a system of grading and it's very good. It's intense though um, and uh, detailed. It's like a college course. Um, And I also read a ton of information online. Uh, Sister Mountain has a whole series of blog posts on how to grade using spreadsheets. Uh, Marnie McLean has a series on how to grade patterns using Excel. Um, There is a long series in nitty.com on the free online magazine about grading and sizing patterns. Um, If you go to my personal page, which is Trico Edit, T-R-I-C-O-T-E-D-I-T, here on Instagram, I have a highlight with some of those resources there. Now, I found that we needed more than just what was available free online. So I also, I wrote a course with Julie Robinson and Melissa Metzbauer. Julie Robinson is a knitwear designer. Melissa is another tech editor. And we have a course on grading um, knit for knits and crochet. And that is available at the tech editor hub. Um, and so you can always take my course, uh, which is available there. Uh, and that we open again in the summertime. So we only open four times a year for that course. So if you have questions about grading, you can feel free to send us uh, a direct message. Um, but that's how I learned. Um, I have to say, um, so she says, yes, she master says class she... on grading seems perfect, but I can't afford it at the moment. So I would say apply for a scholarship. There they have scholarship. a scholarship program too. So definitely apply for the scholarship. But... I, I think everything I've learned about grading, I've learned being a tech editor. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. it's because all of the studying I did to be a tech editor and then all of the reading I've continued to do mm-hmm. in working with patterns and all the things that Sarah named, reading all of those articles and posts. Mm-hmm to educate myself as I continued working and edited more patterns. And I've learned a lot about grading, not in a place where I feel comfortable grading someone else's pattern, but I've learned a lot about fit and grading being a tech editor. Um, And I am taking the masterclass on grading because I want, I want to know the, like I understand the grading principles and the grading rules and the concepts. And I've been working with them for a long time in advising my clients, but I would like to know how to get there. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the stuff I'm missing. That's the piece I'm missing is the, how do I get from what I know has to happen and what I want to have happen? How do we, how do we do it? How do you do it in the math? (laughs) How do we do it? Yeah. So what I would say is everything that we teach in a masterclass on grading, you do not have to purchase. You can find that information for free. If you do your research and, you find you can find the information online or in books, um, and you can find it in your li- your local library. Uh, so, don't feel obligated that you have to purchase a course in order to be a good grader. Because we have 
I have colleagues that have never taken my course oh, who yeah. are excellent at grading. Oh, for sure. And I work with a lot of designers who have just been grading for a long time and learned it in the books that we have, like mm -hmm. the books that we have and use in all the articles that she mentioned. Um, even more, there's, you know, lots of resources out there to learn to grade. What I like about their course is just going through the process step by step mm -hmm. really helps me in the way that I learn. So that's what I really like about it. And there's a lot of information in that course about the history of grading and why we, why we've come to do things the way we do and you know, what it means and how, why it works the way it works. So, um, yeah, please do apply for another scholarship. <laughs> we have a limited number two for to offer. So um, I'm sorry that you are not accepted for it, but uh, please do apply again. Um, thank you for your question, though. Uh, grading is an important aspect of designing. It's very important. So if you are interested in becoming a designer that ha offers multiple sizes to your knitters in your designs, eventually you're going to have to learn how to grade. Um, and there's a lot of great help out there online for free. You don't have to take a course to learn how to grade. Um, so any well, other questions? Grading, grading is also part of designing in the way that style is in that mm -hmm. there's, there's going to be lots of choices you have to make about style, right? Style yes. choices you have to make. Well, when you take your sample and make it into a lot of sizes, there's going to be a lot of design choices that you're going to need to make in yes. that grading. Yes. And so you might not always want it. Um, have someone else do that work for you because there's going to be a lot of design choices that will have to be made in the grading. Right. So it's also creative work. Yes, it is. Absolutely. It's art and science all mixed up together. It really is. Knitting is so cool. <laughs> Knitting is. It's math and art and design and creative. And so I think we're coming to the end of our of this month's tech tip unless you guys tech tip q a you guys have any more questions for us you can throw them into the comments real quick uh just as a reminder for those of you who joined partway through next month we will be meeting on june 21st at 12 p.m eastern time on youtube, YouTube. we'll be re we'll be reposting the video here on instagram but we're going to be doing it live on YouTube. So please go to our bio here and sign up for our newsletter and also subscribe to our YouTube channel because we will be broadcasting live from YouTube from now on. Um, it's going to be so good. It's going to be That's so much good. better. <laughs> so uh, the T weasel says sister mountain does proportional grading. And you mentioned during fix measures, I'm confused as to which to use. Um, so, we did talk at length about uh, relative have, ease and fixed ease. We have a ease. Q and A. If you go on our website to the yep. episodes or to YouTube, the title of the Q and A is fixed ease, and mm -hmm. we talk the whole time about why fixed ease works and why we follow those rules. I also have a, um, a blog post article mm -hmm. on my website. It's called a case against proportionate ease in adult garments. Mm -hmm. And it's on my website, Christina Uh, if you want to learn about it and read it instead of, um, but there's more in the video and more and like, it's a long you know. discussion on why, why yeah, we, we can't answer have it in five opinion. minutes, but <laughs> um, it is a really good question. And it's, mm -hmm. um, really it important is. to learn about because it impacts right. greatly impacts things greatly. And, Everything that Sister Mountain talks about as far as using numbers and, you know, using the spreadsheet, it's all applicable. So how you choose to apply your design ease to the various sizes is not, there's not, there is the way that we feel you should do it. And other people may feel differently and they're entitled to their opinion for sure. Um, so uh, if, I'm sorry if it confuses you, but feel free to go read some of the uh, in some of the other places on our website and also on Christina's website. And I think Julie Robinson has a blog post. She has on... hers is her um, article is called "Fixed Ease Versus Relative Ease," mm -hmm. and she explains really well defines those things. Yeah, in some parts of this is a nuance of uh, grading that 
takes a lot of discussion. So uh, perhaps we'll address it again in the future, but we'd like to point you to our previous Q&A on this topic to get some yeah, more information. Yeah, check it out. It's called on, Fixed Ease. And, um, mm -hmm, on our opinion on it, of course. <laughs> right, um, right. But thank you for asking. So uh, we'll see you guys next month on YouTube. Uh, feel free to subscribe over there. We'll be doing it as a live event where you will be able to put in comments like you do here. Um, and we're hoping in the future to have some guests on our Tech Tip Talk. Um, so if you have anybody that you'd like us to interview or talk to, please let feel, us know. Please let us know. We have some ideas. Um, we'd like to expand this a little bit to we are some always other. open to what you guys think. Always. So she says um, thank you. Good. Yes, excellent. You're so we'll see yeah. you next month. Thank you for being here. We'll see you at June 20. Did I get the date First, right? 21st. June 21st at noon Eastern over on YouTube. Feel free to send us a question anytime between now and then. Um, and make sure you are subscribed to our newsletter. So you're welcome, Amy. Thanks for being here. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, to everyone, for your questions and your comments. We love chatting with you. We'll see you we next totally month. We totally do. We'll see you next month. Bye.